Hi again. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about extrusion, and this is probably the longest section in uh, terms of polymer processing that I'm going to talk about. There's a little bit to it. So extrusion, it's the most widely used process for forming continuous plastic profiles such as tubing and sheeting, etc. So uh, particularly prevalent for uh, catheters and um, dialysis tubing, that type of thing. It's similar to injection molding. The concept is very much the same, except the process is continuous. So in injection molding, um, there is one mold, there is one piece per mold, so it's discrete. Uh, in extrusion, um, the, the concept is the same. It goes into a feed hopper uh, through a screw, um, and it's extruded in a continuous fashion. Um, and there is some sort of a cutting device which cuts the um, the tubing into pieces. So it uses a metal die which is placed at the end of the extrusion barrel to form the piece rather than a mold. Um, and this is um, an example. So here it's a nozzle. Uh, there would be some sort of a die there that gives the ejected polymer its shape. So like injection molding, the barrel and its internal screw melts the polymer to its melting temperature based on the melt flow index and it squeezes the molted plastic through the die which forms the tubing profile or the sheeting as required. After being squeezed through the die the plastic is drawn to a water cooling bath like this where the temperature is progressively lower before the material is coiled or spooled for downstream processing. You can make multi-lumen uh, tubing, which is getting more and more common in the medical device industry, uh, depending on the design of the extrusion machine die. Uh, there's a number of flow channels are possible in the same uh, piece of tubing also. So the critical pra operating parameters for extrusion are uh, the temperature of the barrel and screw, the die profile. So this is an example of a die here. This, this is the profile. Whether it's a multi-layer or co-extrusion, are you going to um, co-extrude two different uh, polymers? Uh, the speed of the operation, the distance to the water cooling bath, whether it's a single or a double barrel, melt flow index, shrinkage and cost. So similar to injection molding. So the components, the extruder drive is electrical in operation and it's geared via thrust to produce the rotational movement of the extruder screw. The polymer feed is from the feed hopper and the feed may be gravity, metering or simple conveying spiral. The barrel and the screw are high strength steel and they're protected from wear and corrosion using hardening and coating treatments. So the resin itself, uh, you may have seen this type of plastic resin before. Um, so this is the plastic resin that's fed into the feed hopper. It's stored in a clean, dry area and is temperature controlled. It can be dried prior to use, being careful not to over dry, and it can be preheated, which is a steady state process. In flood feeding, the resin is added to the extruder until the hopper is nearly filled and then the resin falls to the feed screw by gravity. Um, trickle or star feeding, the resin pellets are administered to the hopper and then to the feed screw at a known controlled rate, usually governed by weight. And this is used where layers are particularly thin, so it's more controlled. The resin can have additives such as colorants and UV inhibitors, and they can be used, um, which are used and mixed into the resin prior to arriving at the hopper. Um, so colorants would be common enough in medical devices to differentiate one device from another. The material enters the feed throat and comes in contact with the screw. The rotating screw then usually turns at about 100 RPM and it forces the plastic beads to move forward into the barrel. The barrel is heated to the desired melt temperature of the molten plastic and the pa plastic beads melt gradually as they are pushed through the barrel. This reduces the risk of overheating the gradual melt rate which could cause degradation in the product. Extra heat is contributed by the intense pressure and friction taking place inside the barrel. Um, and this leads to extra melting and uh, extra mixing. So cooling fans are present in most extruders to keep temperature below a set value. And the molten plastic next enters the dye. 
So the dye is what gives the final product its profile and it must be designed so the molten plastic evenly flows from a cylindrical profile to the product's profile shape. The product must now be cooled and this is usually achieved by pulling the extra day through a water bath. And if you're trying to imagine what a dye looks like, uh, you might have a, or your children might have a Play-Doh set at home where Play-Doh is forced through some sort of a mould and it comes out in a tube type format or a pasta maker, that type of thing. So that's what the dye is. It gives the uh, polymer its shape. The barrel and screw then are zoned into between three and seven sections. We talked about this in injection mould earlier. Um, each section may be individually heated and cooled. Um, so some extra sections we didn't talk about. We talked about the feed-in zone. We talked about compression. We talked about metering. There may be a degassing zone, uh, which allows um, any volatiles to escape. And then there's a final metering zone again. So the feed zone, as we said, this preheats the plastic and it conveys it along. A constant screw depth allows sufficient material to be fed, but not so much that the supply is overrun. Um, a maximum delivery can be achieved by having a relatively deep channel. So this is the channel here. A low degree of friction between the granules and the screw and a high degree of friction between granules and the barrel wall. In order to melt the granules, heat is generated internally by friction or by externally applying heat from heaters wrapped around the barrel, and this must be controlled. If the material becomes too hot, it starts to decompose um, or degrade. If it's too cold, it's insufficiently plasticized um, and it doesn't mix well. So to prevent overheating, cooling water uh, may be circulated around the barrel. So the next part of the, the zone is the compression zone. And here the screw depth gradually decreases so as to compact the plastic. It squeezes any trapped air pockets back into the feed zone and it improves heat transfer. As the material goes from the feed zone to the melt zone, there is an increase in the screw root diameter. And this results in a decrease in the volume of space enclosed by the thread. So granule melting should occur around the compression zone. And the compression zone, sometimes called the transition zone, could be of two types. It could be a gradual transition, where there's a long compression zone. And um, this would be for plastics that have a high melting range, or it could have a sudden transition, which is a very short compression zone for plastics that have a very narrow melting range. And examples of these would be nylon. Um, and this enables the, the plastic to um, melt in a more linear manner. So the metering zone is the last zone, and here the screw depth is homogeneous but less than the feed zone. It supplies the material at a constant rate. The material is of uniform temperature and pressure and it's homogeneously mixed, uh, which means it enters the dye at the right temperature and it is mixed appropriately. So the metering zone pressure is generated by restriction of flow in the melt zone, so having a, a wide screw diameter. The channel depth is um, decreased, therefore, and the channel width is decreased. The screw can be water-cooled at this point, which lardens, hardens the layer of polymer at the very outside, just against the barrel wall, and it reduces the effect of channel depth. Um, this gives a restriction in the die head, which just leads to backup of pressure. Um, which leads to increase in melt viscosity and just a better mix coming through the dye. So the length of these zones depends on the material. Heat sensitivity is an issue, so as we pointed out, nylon melts quickly. The compression can be formed in one pitch of a screw. Uh, PVC is very heat sensitive, um, so the compression zone covers the length of the screw. The venting zone, which I talked about just a moment ago, or degassing, is where um, most materials are hygroscopic, so they absorb moisture, and this can lead to poor quality. So um, the granules are taken in, they're compressed and homogenized, homogenized in the usual way. The melt pressure is then reduced to atmospheric pressure in the decompression zone, and this allows any volatiles that are there to escape. 
So at the end of this melt zone, or the metering zone, and before it enters the dye, the polymers often push through what's called a breaker plate, which is fixed between the barrel and the dye. Um, it's slightly more than two recesses cut into the barrel and the dye head. And what the breaker plate does is it further increases back pressure. It turns rotational flow of the melt. So the, the melt is rotating on the screw. It's forced through this breaker plate and it changes that rotational into a longitudinal flow before it goes into the die. And the, this is the die here. It holds back any impurities and it holds back unplasticized material. Uh, so think of it as a filter. Now, often there is a filter as, as well as the breaker plate. Um, it may be a stainless steel wire mesh, um, the filter that is between the breaker plate and the screw. So these screen packs are attached to the breaker plate and they're gauze fil filters. So this is the breaker plate here and these are the filter packs. I said they're usually stainless steel. They filter the melt to between 120 to 150 microns, um, which gives it a very pure uh, formulation. However, even smaller particles can cause cracks in plastics. Uh, so you can achieve a very fine melt filtration with a 45 micron filter, which significantly improves uh, performance. So it's holding back any particles greater than 45 microns, especially important in medical devices. So um, in coronary catheters or vascular access devices um, where purity is extremely important. So after the breaker plate and filter, it goes through the dye, and these are different dye designs that are available. So this would be a hollow tube, um, coil, uh, rectangular, etc. The dye channels the polymer melt from the front of the screw to form the basic shape of the desired products. Calibration units on the extruder measure the form of the output and adjust it to the detailed shape while the polymer is being cooled, and cooling takes place in a water bath. A saw or cutter cuts the profile to the desired length. An alternative to cutting is to spool the tubing onto coils using preformed cores or um, cordless technology. Additional operations may be performed, so the um, two pieces may be um, bonded together or there may be a coating applied to the extruded device. So sometimes on the same line, a secondary process may occur. In the manufacture of adhesive of tape, for example, a second extruder melts adhesive and applies this to the plastic sheet. So the outputs of extrusion depends on screw dimensions, die dimensions, the screw RPM, the viscosity and uh, temperature. And if you want to increase output in extrusion, you would increase the sp screw speed, increase screw diameter, uh, change the helix angle of the screw thread, um, just like this, up to 30 degrees, and increase the die diameter. We've looked at the critical operating parameters already. And just to point out that in medical devices, um, multi-layer tubing is very common, and this allows for creation of tubing with different properties for the interior and the exterior surfaces. Um, so, for example, um, the outside of the tubing may be hydrophilic and the inside hydrophobic or vice versa. So the active materials can be located in their optimal performance and the bondable materials be located inside or outside uh, for ease of assembly of complex medical devices can be achieved. So that completes the section on extrusion. Thank you.